live. Well, good morning. Welcome to the virtual Arthur Evangelical Free Church. It is, is good that we can worship together even in a, a different kind of scenario. Uh, we're here recording, uh, and uh, Grace, myself, and Pat up in the sound booth send you, their greeting, send you our greetings. And I'd just like uh, to uh, call us to worship together. As you worship together with your family in your home, I'd like to call us to worship with these words from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Friends, this is a unique scenario. Uh, we realize that with the, uh, the virus, uh, COVID-19, uh, spreading around our country and indeed our, our state, uh, this is a unique uh, situation. Uh, we have a, a unique situation where we're not able to worship together as a church family in one building. We look forward to the day when we can do that again. Uh, but at this time, we are gathered uh, as families in living rooms, uh, around TV sets and, and uh, computers, and maybe phone screens. But together, we worship the Lord. And worship is a joy-filled celebration of God, as we saw in Psalm 150. Uh, so I'd just like to lead us in, in prayer. If you would uh, join together, uh, join your hearts together in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that it is uh, to worship you. And Lord, in uncertain times, in times when there is uh, concerning news that changes so regularly, and Lord, in situations where we find ourselves surprised, we acknowledge and we cling to the fact that we know that it is impossible for you to be surprised that you declare the end from the beginning. Uh, Lord, we long for the day uh, when this uh, pandemic uh, will uh, have subsided. We pray for those who are sick. We pray that you would restore them to help quickly. We pray for all those who are working in the front lines of medicine to care for those who are ill, and especially those from our church family who serve in that regard. And Lord, we also lift up our leaders. Your word calls us to pray for our leaders. So we pray for our president. We pray for our governor. We pray for uh, those in uh, positions of giving uh, advice, uh, the CDC and health departments and, and, and uh, doctors, uh, those uh, groups of people that are advising our leaders. Give them wisdom that could only come from you. And give them your peace. Help them to know what to do in times like these. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to give us a desire to call our hearts to pray for one another. Uh, so, Lord, even as uh, we are scattered today, we ask that you would speak to us as together, uh, through technology, we gather and uh, look uh, to your word. And we pray it in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this is unique. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, not, even, not even two weeks ago, let's say one week ago, maybe one week and a few days ago, eight or nine days ago, who would have thought uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, some people will say, what's, uh, what's coming next? Um, I can just be honest, I don't know, uh, and honestly, none of us know for sure, but what I can assure you is that God knows. God declares the end from the beginning. He is sovereign. He is in absolute control. We will have to wait and see, but we ought to, as we wait and see, uh, we trust the Lord who declares the end from the beginning. And uh, in the midst of this time, I would just encourage you as a church family uh, to be constantly in prayer and also uh, to uh, seek to reach out to one another. We realize that we cannot be physically close to each other at this time because uh, in many scenarios, uh, being, uh, stay, keeping our distance and not meeting together in the church building is an act of love, seeking not to spread the virus uh, to others. Uh, but we do live in an age when there is technology, so even in these difficult days, uh, reach out to each other. Use a text, a phone call, a message on Facebook, 
uh, all the technology, uh, take the time to reach out to each other. I would encourage everyone uh, to just, uh, once a day, if you can, to reach out to somebody from our church family, and also uh, to reach out to someone in our community, perhaps, or maybe not, but perhaps in our community, who uh, doesn't, isn't a part of our church, and reach out to them, perhaps, with a text and, and a word of encouragement. Uh, these are times when it can be easy to feel disconnected uh, because we can't gather together, but we can use uh, leverage uh, the blessing of technology uh, to, to uh, help make this a little bit less difficult for all of us. That said, today we're beginning a new series of messages focusing on the New Testament letter of Philippians. And I've given uh, this series the title, Philippians, Finding and Sustaining Real Joy. And that's because the theme of joy runs throughout this letter. Philippians is just four shorter chapters, yet uh, different forms of the word joy occur fully 16 times in this shorter New Testament letter. It's safe to say that joy, joy that transcends circumstances, is a dominant theme here. And I'm convinced that we need this. Oh, how we need this today. It, it isn't for nothing that this letter or this epistle, that's what the word epistle means, this letter, is, has been termed the epistle or letter of joy. And I'm confident that as we walk through this letter together, that we'll be blessed by unpacking and applying it in our lives. I'm convinced that we all need real joy. And so as you're gathered together in your living room with your family, perhaps you're sitting in a seat that's even more comfortable than the seats we have here at the, at the church building, maybe you're in your recliner or on the couch, I'd encourage you to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 1 verse, and the first 11 verses. And we'll follow along together. Uh, again, that's Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And I'll read that in just a moment, but these 11 verses break down into three sections. First, words of greeting, verses 1 and 2. Second, words of thanksgiving, verses 3 through 8. And finally, third, a prayer in verses 9 to 11. Uh, I'll read the whole passage now. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Well, let's begin by looking uh, closely at verses 1 and 2. Uh, first, uh, words of greeting. The beginning words of the letter are similar to the beginning of many New Testament letters uh, in a couple of different ways, so stay here with me. Uh, the senders first are identified, that's simply Paul and Timothy, and then the letter's recipients are mentioned, and that's all, not just some, but all of God's holy people or all of the saints who are in the church in the city at Philippi. And then after mentioning the senders and the recipients, there comes a greeting, a profoundly Christian, a profoundly gospel greeting, uh, a, a greeting that's centered in the gospel a greeting that's centered on God's grace and peace. And did you hear that in verse 2? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now with that said, there are also a couple of differences from typical beginnings of New Testament letters here as well. One of the differences is that Paul and Timothy are simply described as servants. That word that we translate servants can also be translated bond servants, 
or even slaves of Christ Jesus. Paul avoids here appealing to, or even pointing to, or, or otherwise mentioning his apostolic authority. Uh, but in letters where stern correction is needed, uh, he appeals to his authority as an apostle. But here in Philippians, that is not the case. In several of Paul's other letters, he makes a strong and serious point of his authority as an apostle. Galatians would be a good example of this. If you want to see the, some of the similarities and differences between the letters uh, of uh, different letter introductions, look at uh, Galatians and uh, look at Philippians. And you'll see that Philippian, in, in Philippians, Paul just says, I'm a servant of God. Whereas in Galatians, he appeals to his authority. And then Galatians goes on to sternly correct uh, that church. But that's not the case here in Philippians. The difference probably points to the fact that there is a warm affection and friendship that exists between Paul and the Philippians. Uh, another notable departure from the typical letter uh, beginning is the specific mention of the church's leaders. Uh, overseers and deacons. This points us to the reality that Paul respects and has a friendship with the leaders within the Philippian church. He's writing to the whole church uh, by mentioning the churches and by mentioning the church's leaders specifically, he's pointing to the respect and friendship that he has with them. And again, in other letters where there is stern correction or even rebuke, that just is not the case. Now, if you want to know more about the offices of overseer and deacon, uh, read 1 Timothy chapter 3 on your own time. For now, let's just say that an overseer is another word for the office of elder, which is another word for the office of pastor. That's right, overseer, elder, and pastor. It's all the same office in the world of the New Testament. And again, if you want to learn more about that, as many of us are spending more time at home, uh, take the time to uh, get away from the constant news that's flowing and that's coming toward us or uh, the, uh, some of the entertaining, entertainment media that some of us might be enjoying and take more time to read God's Word. And maybe a place uh, to do that would be 1 Timothy 3 to take a look at the office of overseer. A deacon, on the other hand, is someone who ministers or serves. That's actually what the word deacon means, minister or servant. And um, an example of this would be Acts chapter 6, where the apostles appointed deacons to oversee the ministry of caring for needy widows. Um, and the reason for this delegation of ministry was uh, so that they, the apostles, would not neglect the ministry of the Word of God and of prayer. So again, if you have extra time to look into this a little bit more, and you want to say, I, I see this in this greeting, the, the offices of overseer and deacon, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Acts chapter 6. And uh, you can study that and read about that on your own time. And one more thing as we keep moving. If we looked at all the Apostle Paul's letters, we would see that his greetings always contain the words grace and peace. Now, these two words are a powerful expression and summary of the effect of Christ's work. When we gaze at the words grace and peace, we are gazing with wonder on what is accomplished for us through the cross, through Christ's death and resurrection. Grace, not getting what I deserve for my sins. Peace, because Christ went to the cross and suffered as my substitute. He suffered and died and rose again victoriously. Because of that, peace with God is available uh, for all who place their faith, their trust, their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save them. So the words grace and peace, what a glorious summary of the gospel. And the expression of God's peace comes up again in Philippians. We'll look at this, Lord willing, in a few weeks. But Philippians 4, 6 and 7 in the New International Version says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
I like to say it this way. Pray about everything all the time. Instead of simply giving way to anxiety, that first command, do not be anxious, can be hard. You say, there's the news loop about COVID-19, and we're saying, what's next? And then there's the questions about how this could affect the economy, and there's questions about how this could affect our personal jobs, and, and all of these kinds of things. And you say, it, it's so easy, Pastor, to be anxious. Yes, I know. But if you want to experience God's peace, pray about it. Pray about everything all the time. Cast your anxiety on Him. Because he cares for you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The peace of God. We all need God's peace. Well, now let's turn to verses 3 through 8. And here we come to words of thanksgiving. And so, second, words of thanksgiving. Paul joyfully thanks God for the gospel partnership he enjoys with the church at Philippi. I'll read these verses again, and as I read, listen for a couple of themes. Listen for the twin themes of thanksgiving and joy. These words, that's verses 3 through 8, are overflowing with joyful thanksgiving. Also listen for the love and affection uh, that Paul has, uh, that Paul and the Philippians, the Philippian church, uh, that he shares with them, the love and affection that he has for them. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you all are partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in, the and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Right away we see the words, uh, the, 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 uh, we see that in these words, uh, we see that, these, that uh, these words of thanksgiving, uh, that thanksgiving is everything, and uh, they go straight to the heart of what really matters. Paul is deeply thankful for the Philippian church, and he prays for them. He finds himself, and as he prays for them, he feels himself filled with joy. In verse 5, we specifically see that he's thankful for their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And without even taking a breath, so to speak, he continues to express his confidence that God will preserve them to the end. You want some peace, some joy, some comfort today? Look at these words, this promise for all believers. Verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful promise. These words point to their security in Christ. Their security in Christ and our security in Christ. God will finish the good work he started. Their security doesn't depend on them, but on God. Paul is confident that God will bring them through to the end, to the finish line, to Jesus' return. What a glorious uh, promise to reflect on. Now, some background here will be helpful. Uh, the letter of Philippians is in many ways a missionary thank you letter. The Philippian church had been an instrumental in supporting Paul's missionary work for the past decade or so. And as a matter of fact, in chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, uh, we see a picture of this. Paul writes, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And more recently, when it would have been quite tempting... Uh, to pretend that they, that the, uh, for the Philippians to pretend that they didn't know Paul, because after all, we'll see that Paul was in prison. And we'll come to more of that in a minute, uh, but they had sent one of their own, instead of ignoring Paul as he's imprisoned, they had sent one of their own, a man named Epaphroditus, to take care of his needs while he was imprisoned awaiting trial. Uh, chapter 2, verse 25 says this, but I think it is necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, 
co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. This is in view when we read these words toward the end of the book, chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And then a little bit farther down in that chapter, verse 14, speaking about his imprisonment, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. The Philippian church and Paul shared and had shared for quite some time a common commitment to the gospel. And the church had put its commitment into action by tangibly partnering with Paul, with Paul, the missionary church planter, and now then also Taking care, of for, uh, taking care of him as he was imprisoned. And this is an inspiring and challenging picture. It's a picture of putting the gospel at the center of relationships with fellow Christians. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson points out that Philippians 1 can be summed up by the words, put the gospel first. And here in verses 3 through 8, he sums it up saying, Put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of your relationships with believers. Put the, put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of your relationships with believers. And we can clearly see that this is a picture of the relationship here between Paul and the Philippians. But there's more. When their partnership in the gospel from the first day is mentioned, this looks back a decade or so to events that are actually recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 16. Paul and his missionary companions had planted a church in Philippi after God had miraculously directed them to the region of Macedonia. Philippi was the leading city and very important Roman colony within Macedonia. And the first day for the Philippian church was Lydia's conversion and baptism at a riverside, at the riverside in Philippi. Um, I want to read Acts 16, verses 6 to 15. And, uh, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, have been for, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And uh, when they had come to Mysa, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So passing by Mysa, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a, uh, a direct voyage to Samothrace, and uh, the following day to Neapolis, and from Neapolis to Philippi, which is, the leading, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there, would, there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come uh, to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. That was the first day the gospel was proclaimed in Philippi. Now a decade or so later, circumstances had changed, and it isn't and, and, it's, and it's important to understand that Paul was imprisoned. He's enchained. That's what uh, verse 7 uh, says here in our passage this morning. Uh, imprisonment. We find that word. He was not a free man. And if we connect this with, uh, with Acts, we see that he's under house arrest in the city of Rome, awaiting trial before the emperor. Remember I said that the theme of joy runs through the letter of Philippians? Well, the theme of joy runs through the letter of Philippians, and it's joy that's independent of the circumstances. It's joy in the midst of profoundly difficult circumstances. It's joy in the midst of prison, imprisonment. 
Do we live in less than ideal circumstances? Do we live with the reality of a virus that's spreading in our country? Sure. But can we know joy? Yes. We can know absolutely wonderful, glorious joy in the Lord in the midst of difficult circumstances, in the midst of being told, stay at home, uh, in the midst of being told that there are great risks, uh, in the midst of challenging, challenging and confusing situations, we can experience joy, whatever happens, just as Paul experienced joy even in imprisonment. This is Paul's, Paul's first Roman imprisonment, and in the midst of it, he's boldly speaking about Christ. Acts 28, 30 and 31, the final words of Acts say, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now think with me, at first glance, these joy-filled words are surprising when considered against the backdrop of those circumstances. The circumstances that Paul was facing while writing these words makes the discussion of joy surprising, if not downright shocking. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee, when commenting on these, uh, these verses, has pointed out that we see here in Philippians, that what we see here in Philippians 1 is Paul living out what he wrote elsewhere, specifically in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always. How often? Always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. We see here in Philippians 1, Paul living out that call. Rejoice always. We might reasonably expect that in the midst of imprisonment, and there would be complaints about the circumstances. After all, he was not a free man, but that's not what we see here. We do not find complaints here. We have rejoicing and thanksgiving, and in verses 9 through 11, we have prayer. And all of this should give us a push toward joy and thankfulness. A joy that's no matter what. A joy that's independent of the circumstances. A joy uh, that's possible only because of Christ. And if you find yourself saying, such joy, that's not possible, look to Christ. And friends, when we focus our eyes on the wonder of God's grace, when we focus our eyes on the wonder of the gospel, when we take our eyes off our circumstances and look to the forgiveness of sin, to eternal life, to grace, not getting what I deserve for my sin, our perspective will change. I believe that. When we turn our eyes to the gospel, joy, joy that's independent of the circumstances, joy that is enduring even in the most difficult circumstances, is very possible. I believe that. Now, as much as all of, us, as all of this probably surprises us, joy in imprisonment uh, might seem foreign to us, but that wouldn't have surprised the Philippians at all. Back in Acts chapter 16, after uh, Lydia had come to faith, her and her household had been baptized, had come to know Christ, and the church in Philippi was planted, later Paul and Silas, his missionary companion, were thrown into jail, and after being brutally beaten, guess what? They were singing praises of all things at midnight in the jail. And there was an earthquake, many of you know the story, there was an earthquake, and they could have escaped, but, and, uh, but they didn't, and the jailer runs out saying, what must I do to be saved? And I'd just like to read a little bit of that. This is Acts chapter 16, again, you can read all of that in your own time, but this is Acts 16, verses 22 to 26. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates uh, tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them in prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, into the inner prison, and fastened their feet in stocks. So they're not just in prison, they are very much in prison. Their, feets are in, their feet are in stocks, and they're in the middle of the jail. 
And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. You can read the rest of Acts 16 in your own time. But what an amazing account of joy, singing praises to God, even in imprisonment. Let's turn back to Philippians chapter 1, and we come to verses 9 through 11. And third, we have a prayer. Paul records his continual prayer for these believers and their church. Here in verses 9 to 11, we see the content of Paul's continual prayer for the, for the Philippians. Listen to these words again, verses 9 to 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul prays that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and depth of insight. And that leaves us asking, just how important is love? Did you catch that word, love? That your love may abound more and more with knowledge and depth of insight. Think of the, the famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. The, the, well, all of 1 Corinthians 13, focusing on love. But the first words of that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is essential, no question about it. And there's the mention of growing in knowledge and depth of insight, which quite honestly is vitally important. Because he is praying that they will be able to discern what is best and ultimately be pure and blameless at Jesus' return. And we need to pray this too, Lord, that you would help us to discern what is best. I mean, we are in new territory together. New territory for all of us. Lord, give us wisdom. That we would have discernment, that we would know what is best. And ultimately, that we would be pure and blameless at Jesus' return. And then in verse 11, there's this phrase, filled with the fruit of righteousness. A genuine, growing relationship with Jesus Christ will produce fruit. Jesus himself says this in John 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If we are connected to Jesus Christ, we will produce fruit. And then the letter of Galatians lists what's often termed the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let's think about this. This is a model prayer for us in at least a couple of different ways. It's a model prayer in what it prays for. There's really no question this prayer puts the gospel first. Bible scholar D.A. Carson sums up verses 9 to 11 saying, Put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. Put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. But that's not all. In the midst of the situation Paul faced, we might expect in prayer something like this. If you were in prison, what would you pray? We might naturally be inclined to pray, God, get me out of this. And I certainly believe that we can and should be honest with God. But how Paul prays for the Philippians here is both instructive and challenging. I'd encourage us 
to pray these things for our fellow believers. Have you ever found yourself wondering what to pray for someone? How do I pray for someone? Verses 9 to 11 is a great model. Have you ever found yourself seeking to pray more than God bless that person and give me or give them this or that? I'm not saying that we shouldn't we should bring requests to God, absolutely, but want to pray more and deeper? Here's a great model. This prayer has real substance. It's more than telling God a list of things that we want. And in that, it is a challenging and inspiring example for all of us. I genuinely believe that all of us ought to be praying these types of prayers for our brothers and sisters in Christ far more than we do. I genuinely believe that we ought to be praying these types of prayers for our brothers and sisters in Christ today. So now let's take a couple of minutes and put all of this together. As we looked at these 11 verses, we've seen first a word of greeting, words of greeting, second words of thanksgiving. Paul joyfully thanks God for the gospel partnership that he enjoys with the church at Philippi. And third, we come to a prayer. A prayer. Paul records his continual prayer for these believers in their church. And all of us, and all of this in all of this, we should be experiencing a nudge to examine our attitudes. And all, all of this should nudge us to look into our heart and to consider. Think with me about this. Remember those words, 1 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here in these 11 verses, we see these words lived out, when it would be hardest to live them out. When facing persecution that had led to imprisonment. So ask yourself, am I putting the gospel first? Ask yourself, is the gospel at the center of my relationships with fellow believers? Ask yourself, is the gospel at the center of my prayer life. When we focus on the gospel, joy and thanksgiving, independent of our circumstances, will be possible. Think about it. Because of the gospel, all who have received God's gift, those who have the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, have forgiveness of sin instead of standing unforgiven before the holiness and perfection of God. Peace with God Peace and friendship with God instead of war with him. Eternal life instead of eternal death. Heaven instead of hell. Hope instead of complete hopelessness. So uh, think about it. If you're saying today I need some joy, I need uh, to find joy in these difficult and confusing times. Times that people have said uh, puts us in new territory. Gaze on the gospel. Gaze on what we have in Christ, and joy is possible. Is your joy lagging? Preach the gospel to yourself. Reflect on what Christ has done. And finally, ask yourself today, am I a committed follower of Jesus Christ? If yes, praise God. Let's reflect with wonder and with joy on all that God has done for us in Christ. But maybe you can't say that you're a committed follower of Jesus Christ. You can't honestly say that you've asked him to be your savior. Friends, you could turn your life over to him right now. Even in your living room, maybe as families, you're saying, some of you are saying, I know Jesus Christ is my savior. I've personally surrendered my life to him. I've received what Christ has done and I've bowed my knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe others of us are saying, I have not personally made that commitment. You could make that commitment right now. Today could be the day when you say, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, and I acknowledge that I'm powerless to save myself. And ask the Lord Jesus to save you. Tell him that you're placing your faith, your trust, your belief in him alone to save you. Tell him that you're surrendering your life to him. And if you're not ready to take that step, at least do this. If you're watching this video, 
You say, I'm not ready to commit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do this. Commit yourself to investigate. Our days are numbered. Nobody knows how many we have. So investigate who Jesus is. And I pray that very soon you can say that you've come to the realization that you're a sinner and that you're powerless to save yourself. And that you've come to the place that you realize that what you deserve for your sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. And that you have come to the place where you're ready to bow your knee personally to King Jesus. That you're ready to place your faith, your trust, your belief in him alone to save you. As we gaze on the gospel, as we gaze on what we have been saved from, we are called to joy. To joy that's independent of the circumstances. If you have some time this week, I have one more challenge for you. Read the letter of Philippians. It's not that long. It's only uh, four chapters. And with a pencil, mark or maybe, maybe underline or circle every place where you find the word joy or the word rejoice. This letter written from prison to the Philippians is indeed an epistle of joy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning as we're connected in an unusual way, over distance spread throughout our community, we pray that even in the midst of whatever may happen, and Lord, we pray uh, in a very real way that um, this, this virus and the effects of this virus will be far less than some think it could be. We pray that those who are sick will recover. But even in the midst of hard things, even in the midst of new territory, even in the midst of things being closed, and in the midst of uncertainty and, and the challenges that come with that, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be people of joy. People who have grounded joy. So that a watching world will see and say something is different. And that we'd have an opportunity to point to the wonder of the gospel, which gives us joy, independent of the circumstances. And we pray all these things, Lord, in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.